anxiety, depression, these are all signs of endocannabinoid deficiency, migraines, PMS, menopausal symptoms, uh, poor memory, uh, blood sugar imbalances, uh, cardiac, cardiovascular issues, all of these can be affected by the endocannabinoid system. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Dr. Haile Cass, welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm so excited to have you here. You're one of the pioneers of integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry. And you are yourself a psychiatrist, but you specialize in functional medicine, psychiatry, integrative mental health, and you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, you're a frequent guest on radio, TV, podcasts, and documentaries. You've written several books, uh, which are very popular, The Addicted Brain and How to Break Free, Natural Highs with Patrick Holford, and one of my personal favorites, which is Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health. You've helped thousands of people enhance their mind and mood, as well as overcome addiction using targeted nutritional supplements. And your latest edition is CBD, which is the topic of our podcast today which enhances the effects of all the other nutrients. And your website is www.cassmd.com. So I'm really excited to have you here, Hyla. You're sort of the godmother of functional medicine in many ways. <laughs> and, and what I'd like to ask you is, first of all, like how did you go from being a conventional psychiatrist to being drawn to functional medicine psychiatry? I don't know if I was ever conventional because yeah. who I brought to my residency and to psychiatry was an unconventional approach to things. I've always thought outside the box. So when we were observing in the residency even that there was a, a problem with side effects with medications and that actually psychotherapy worked very well, there was neurofeedback, there were other means for handling issues uh, of mental health issues um, rather than medication, I kind of went that in that direction. And then I began to look at nutrition, began to follow Abram Hoffer, Carl Pfeiffer, and some of the early greats. And there was very little in those days. I mean, really little. What we have now are many organizations that teach integrative psychiatry, functional medicine. It's great, much better. We still don't have enough practitioners, but it, there, there's hope now. There, there is much more penetration into the general um, knowledge base of a, a more integrative approach. I agree. I think it's really growing in a big, big way. And uh, I think there's still a disconnect between the research and practice, as you, as you point out. And I think there are not enough psychiatrists who are trained in this and you know, it's still not mainstream enough, but it's definitely going in that direction, which is great news for everyone. So what I'd love to discuss is your real specialty you've developed over the years, which is essentially uh, CBD oil and the endocannabinoid system. And very few people, I think, know about the endocannabinoid system. I mean, it was a relatively recent discovery, if I'm not mistaken, in the early 1990s, the endocannabinoid system was discovered. So can you tell us a little bit about this system and why it's important for mental health? It's so interesting because it's, it fills the entire body. Every cell is connected to the endocannabinoid system. And yet it was hidden in plain sight. We didn't know it was there. Uh, once it was discovered, it became apparent what it does. And it's a master balancer and communicator. So it actually helps all the cells to communicate and all the systems to communicate. Hormones, the immune system, cardiovascular, GI, the brain and nervous system, all of these can communicate with each other by means of the endocannabinoid system. And its role is not just communication, but actually to create balance and calm. And it works with the parasympathetic nervous system 
you know, there's the sympathetic fight or flight where we're, you know, we're really like on adrenaline and we're pushing and um, too many of us are in that phase too much of the time. And the parasympathetic nervous system is calm, relax, rest and digest. And that's what the endocannabinoid system does. It works with the, as part of the parasympathetic nervous system to help us rest and restore. That's very interesting. How does it do that exactly? I mean, what is the mechanism through which it works? Is it like sort of the neuroendocrine system? Is it, does it work in the same way as hormones and neurotransmitters or is it slightly different? It, it does. It works with them. Okay. And we have, what's, what's interesting is that we actually have our own, what are called endocannabinoids, which means in inner, inner cannabinoids. We make them, we make our own um, with the equivalent of a phyto, there's a phytocannabinoid, which is a plant-based cannabinoid. And then there's the, um, the endocannabinoids. And the ones that we really know about are anandamide and 2-AG. And anandamide, by the way, means bliss in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. So that was discovered uh, when we, we learned about THC. It was the THC in cannabis that made people high, that made them feel good. And uh, that it is, uh, it influences the endocannabinoid system. That's so interesting. And so in terms of the way it affects our parasympathetic nervous system, so it helps us deal with stress. Is that correct? So would you put it yes. on a sort of par with say GABA, which is the calming neurotransmitter? Does it have a similar impact in the sense that it sort of calms you down? Is that how it works? Well, it, it does a lot more than that because it interfaces with all of the neurotransmitters. So if you need more calming at a particular time, it will bring out the GABA and maybe serotonin. It's very active on serotonin receptors. There's re excellent research on that. It interacts with a 5-HT1A receptor. So it influences GABA, it influences serotonin, it influences dopamine, which is for focus, concentration, motivation. And if you're not um, manifesting enough of that, you're going to be sort of sitting on the couch and you can't move. You know, that's, that's one extreme. So what it's going to do is balance. It will actually shift in favor of a more active uh, neurotransmitter like dopamine. So it creates balance among all the neurotransmitters or chemical messengers that I just mentioned. That's amazing. So it works almost like an adaptogen, like, you know, the sort of uh, mm -hmm. herbs like ashwagandha and ginseng, which basically if your neurotransmitter is too low, it'll increase it. And if it's too high, it'll sort of lower it. So it sounds like that's incredibly useful. And what are the things that get in the way of you know, the, the smooth functioning of this system, which sounds incredibly important for our neurotransmitters. Well, what happens is there are many people who have a low endocannabinoid system or endocannabinoid deficiency. And uh, it's becoming more common as we have more and more stress and stress tends to lower the endocannabinoids. It can be stress, it can be dietary deficiency, because actually just like all the neurotransmitters are made from precursors, you know, you take tyrosine to make dopamine or um, tryptophan to make serotonin. By the same token, essential fatty acids, which turn into arachidonic, arachidonic acid, will be a precursor to CBD, to the endocannabinoids. And CBD is a phytocannabinoid which we'll explain in a minute too. So CBD is an exogenous cannabinoid essentially, whereas the anandamide and the um, other one that you mentioned, which I think was the uh, 2-AG, exactly. Those are endogenous and CBD is exogenous. Is that correct? Yeah. And in terms of mental health, so what are the possible manifestations to our mental health of a sort of malfunctioning or less than optimally functioning endocannabinoid system. I know it leads to all sorts of mental health symptoms. Right. What are the ones that you think are the most common? Well, believe it or not, most of them. For example, post-traumatic stress disorder. It, it, what's amazing is that people who have a good level of endocannabinoids in them are in a way protected 
from post-traumatic stress disorder, as opposed to those who have a low endocannabinoid system or a deficiency, and they will be more prone. So we don't have lab tests that we can use, although they are used in research. They, they did a study uh, with people who had been exposed to the 9-11 tragedy, and a number of them developed PTSD, another group did not. And what they determined was that the group that did have PTSD had very low endocannabinoids. Now, now what, what we would do, what you and I would do, would be give them some CBDs to raise the endocannabinoid system, but they don't go that far. You know, studies are studies. So it always fr frustrates me when I see that there's such an obvious path to help these people, the, re the so-called research subjects, and it's not done. Yeah. But that would, that would be the solution there. So uh, anxiety, depression, these are all signs of endocannabinoid deficiency, migraines, PMS, menopausal symptoms, uh, poor memory, uh, blood sugar imbalances, uh, cardiac, cardiovascular issues. All of these can be affected by the endocannabinoid system and can be improved uh, when you have a low endocannabinoid system and then you have these symptoms, they can be corrected with the right use of of a phytocannabinoid such as CBD. That's fascinating. And so, you know, one of the challenges I think of functional medicine is being able to identify exactly, you know, what is the root cause? And so, you know, is the cause of your depression and anxiety and poor memory, could it be because you have a low endocannabinoid system or it could be something else? But then I think back to the question about what causes or what could be contributing to a low endocannabinoid system are the same causes that could be contributing to hormone imbalances, neurotransmitter imbalances, gut issues, et cetera. And so I think those are the key essentially. So you mentioned stress. So if you're chronically stressed, that could lower your endocannabinoid system. Is there a genetic component to this? Yes, there's definitely a genetic component, but as we know, it's really the epigenetics that counts. That is, we can influence how our genes are expressed. We are not stuck. We're not stuck with the genes that we were given, but they, they're, they're the pattern, but we definitely can overcome that pattern by providing the right precursors. Understood. And other things I, I think I've heard you mention in the past is sort of infections can also lower the endocannabinoid system, inflammation, gut issues, and poor nutrition. And these can all have a negative impact on our endocannabinoid system. So really the same things as a lot of other uh, things that get our metabolism or our neuroendocrine system out of balance also affect the endocannabinoid system. And so if this happens, you can then prescribe an exogenous a cannabinoid, which you mentioned as being CBD. So tell us about CBD, how it works. I mean, it sounds incredible and you're very experienced in administering it. What is it and how does it work? CBD works on the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And th those are part of the endocannabinoid system. What's interesting is they don't exactly act like a neurotransmitter usually does, which is to uh, go to the receptor site. Instead, it actually prevents the breakdown of your own natural anandamide or 2-AG. So it influences the enzyme, which is FA, F-A-A-H, and it stands for a much longer chemical name, which I will say, um, and you don't have to pronounce it. So it influences FA and that allows more anandamide to stay intact and working on the CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. So it's so interesting. It works almost like an SSRI in the sense that an SSRI will prevent the reuptake of serotonin. The CBD oil is preventing disintegration of the anandamide molecule. Is that how it works? That's exactly how it works. Okay. Right? Fascinating. And so essentially what you're doing is you're boosting the levels of endocannabinoids by providing the CBD oil. And where, where is this from? And, and, you know, we have a sort of 
when we think of CBD, we think, oh, you know, pot or marijuana, you know, legal substance, exactly. legalizing substances. So how does that fit into this whole debate, the CBD oil? Great question. So they're both from the cannabis plant and the cannabis plant has cannabinoids in it. And the most, you, uh, the, the biggest one, the one that takes up the most volume is the CBD followed by THC. And then there are probably a hundred other cannabinoids. And there are also terpenes, which have a medicinal effect. And the terpenes are the part of most plants, all plants that have, uh, at least medicinal plants that have the scent and the medicinal value. So, you know, the smell of lavender and it's very calming or oregano is very healing and has a distinctive, very distinctive smell. I mean, it smells like pizza. So, <laughs> um, or pizza smells like oregano. So we have um, CBD and all of the, and these other cannabinoids and um, th they are, they're all from the cannabis plant, but there's the hemp branch of this family. And the hemp branch of the family has been bred to grow long, stocky plants that they were originally and still are bred for the use in paper and cloth and many, many, many uses. And hemp has, had been grown for many, many years until uh, it was prohibited during the, the prohibition against um, marijuana. There was reefer madness and all that history of uh, the government turning against uh, the use of marijuana. So that's a whole other story. So these days, the, the marijuana that you get, the pot, which is from cannabis, has been bred to be very high in THC because the whole point of it is to get people high. Um, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, because it's been bred to be so high in THC that very often it over, it way overshadows the CBD. And as a result, a lot of people, particularly younger people, have a problem with it because the THC can be actually activating. And uh, I have seen cases of people who um, did, who smoked some pot and became quite agitated and maybe even paranoid or violent and ended up in an emergency room. Then they get a shot of medication. Then there's a whole series of events that happen from that. They're labeled uh, potentially psychotic or they're labeled manic depressive. Oh, this is uncovered a manic depressive issue. Mm -hmm. So now they're, they're put on meds, they're put on a series of cocktail of meds. And it's, it's really quite a disaster. Because these are often, as I said, young people, college age, perhaps, and it it can actually ruin their their university career and and their lives. And what these people need is actually CBD to counter the THC. What CBD does is it goes between it, like it blocks the THC at the receptor, at the receptor site, so that the THC can't have its influence. So it undoes the influence, but at the same time, it's providing something, it's providing that calm and balance. So you reverse those really awful effects of the anxiety and paranoia and fear, and, and that can happen fairly quickly. And then the individual is not doomed to be on medication forever because generally when people are put on psych meds, it really ends up being a life sentence. And I say a life sentence and I say it in a very dire way because I mean it. I've seen just too many people who have been on meds long-term, the meds are not working. And at the same time, it, they're having side effects and they can't get off the medication because it's, it's difficult. It has, it has to be withdrawn slowly and using the right nutrients to help it along. Completely. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a huge problem and withdrawal is very, very tricky. But so that's fascinating. Why have the plants been uh, bred to be so high in THC as opposed to CBD? I mean, it used to be presumably that the ratio of the natural plant is sort of perfectly balanced so that you don't have those nasty effects. Why has it been bred to be so high in THC? 
Well, what do you think? No. <laughs> it's because it sells. You know, that's business. People want to get high, and the more THC you have, the higher you get. Interesting. So that's kind of how it goes. Understood. In terms of getting hold of the CBD, what's the best source of CBD? How do you know that it's good quality and how would you take it and, and what doses? Well, you want to get it from a reputable supplier, someone that's been around. You want to have them supply what's called a certificate of analysis, which shows that what's in it is what's supposed to be in it, not anything that's not supposed to be in it. And one, one of the issues with the hemp plant or with the cannabis plant is that it concentrates, it's a concentrator. So if there is any um, toxicity within the soil, any old chemicals from fertilizers, pesticides, uh, whatever's in the soil, heavy metals, it's going to come into the plant mm -hmm. and you're going to ingest it. So you wanna have it organically grown and not just organically grown from recent times, but to have soil that has not been exposed to all of these um, toxins. And that will show up in a certificate of analysis. So that's one thing. Uh, and you want, as I said, you know, I need to know your supplier. It's, it's readily available in the US. I don't know what the situation is in the UK. What is yeah. it? Actually? I mean, you can, you can buy it online and there are various sources, but obviously you have to make sure that it is a reputable source, but there, it is available here, but it's very difficult to tell because, you know, a lot of it is manufactured differently or, you know, and I think what you mentioned about the certificate is really important because the quality and the concentration varies tremendously. Yeah. I mean, when, when, for my own brand, uh, I chose a specific cultivar uh, from a, a group of farms in the Midwest and or it's organically grown then taken to the plant where it's extracted and mixed to my specifications and includes MCT oil rather than hemp oil which is kind of heavy and grassy tasting which I don't like and uh, I did it to my own taste and I added this essential oil essential lemon oil to give it a lemon flavor which makes it kind of nice, pleasant tasting. So it's been well received and it works quite well. It has a good complement of um, cannabinoids, terpenes, and we can actually add more terpenes to order. So it, it's quite versatile. Uh, and by the way, uh, when you, we're, we're referring to CBD, but it's really hemp oil extract yeah. because CBD is only one of the cannabinoids. Um, it can contain a trace of THC by law in, in the US, it has to be under 0.3%. Uh, in the UK, it's less than 0.2%. So there's a bit of a difference there. And it's really kind of arbitrary. I mean, really. And my preference is actually to get the full spectrum that does not have that trace of THC taken out. Because once you are um, working with the product and processing it, there's then this collateral damage. When you remove the THC, even though it's just a little trace, you're also affecting some of the other components. So I'd like it to be as close to nature as possible. And so you have basically the full spectrum, which is everything. Then you have broad spectrum, if I'm not mistaken, which is mm -hmm. Uh, the THC taken out, is that correct? Yeah, but in the process of taking out the THC, I think some of the other uh, components sort of come out with it. Yeah. Uh, and then for people who absolutely cannot have any, not even a trace of THC, they should get the isolate, the THC-free isolate, because interestingly, even though it's such a tiny amount, it can accumulate in the fat cells. And if uh, if individuals are subject to random drug testing, it could be a problem because THC is going to show up. Absolutely. And it's not that they've been smoking pot. It's that it's an accumulation from CBD that they've been taking medicinally. Understood. And then in terms of amounts, I mean, what's a safe amount to take? It's so interesting. It's so individual. It doesn't have to do with your body weight, age, condition, it's so arbitrary because the endocannabinoid level that you have is going to be your own individual level. Yeah. 
and it could just there's such a range. So what I recommend is to be on the safe side, start low and slow, say get uh, like a 750 milligram bottle. When it, a 750 milligram bottle means that each milliliter contains 25 milligrams. And you can start off taking, you know, five or 10 drops and look to see if your target symptom improves and keep, and keep adding more until you actually get some relief. Understood. And in your experience, and, you know, maybe you could talk us through some case studies, but what, what is a sort of key symptom relief that you've, you know, that you've experienced with your patients or people that you've helped in the past with this? that sort of stories that stand out as being, you know, wow, that really worked. Well, a um, lot of different conditions. Now, I can't make disease claims because uh, from the, this is FDA based. Uh, by making a disease claim, that's illegal because that only, you have to be a drug and have gone through all kinds of testing and clearance and whatever and supplements just have, aren't aren't there and they have to be uh, they only can have structure and function claims that being said uh, what i've observed is people with um, with migraines uh, who have to take medication by the way the migraine medications are pretty rough on the system and don't always work yeah. but there was one case of uh, a dad who uh, wrote to me and he said he, his son who's 15 had been having migraines his whole life was missing quite a bit of school each month and he gave him um he he actually interviewed me on his radio show and thought he'd give it a try but the next time his son was starting to get one because generally people have an aura beforehand so he gave it to him and lo and behold he didn't get a migraine it aborted it so he thought well maybe beginner's luck maybe placebo so he tried it again and it worked again. So he was sold. Now, this is an amazing thing to happen to a young man. I mean, here he was missing school and being miserable. And migraine is such a difficult and tricky condition to treat. And there it was. I mean, so that's, that's one, one instance. I've had people in pain, you know, somebody with back pain who, again, didn't want to take opiates because it clouded his mind. He didn't want to become addicted, all of those reasons not to take opiates. So uh, I gave him, he'd never taken CBD. I gave him CBD and very quickly we figured out his dose and he was fine. He was able to, um, to walk around and to sit and to do his normal activities without pain as long as he was taking the CBD. Um, but really it was the hemp oil extract. Amazing. And then I also read about, you were talking about somebody who had dementia and that it's quite good for cognition and memory. Quite an extraordinary story. Tell us a little bit about that because that sounded extraordinary. Well, it's interesting. Uh, this family brought their mother to me and she was not, she was not present. She was kind of dozing off. She was, um, she couldn't really answer my question. So I interviewed the family, uh, not, not her. And it turns out she was disoriented. She would, and they would take her to a restaurant and she insists she'd never been there before. When in fact it was something, a place she'd been to a lot and she had her favorite foods there. She had no recollection of anything. So, uh, and she was also on some psychiatric medications. So what I did was I gave the family a, schedule of reducing, gradually reducing the medication and added in some um, hemp, some of my hemp oil extract. And what happened was, first of all, they took her off the meds a little quicker than I had planned, than I had told them. I don't think there was a miscommunication, but whatever, that actually helped her not be so cloudy. But then the CBD kicked in and she began to remember things. She'd go to a restaurant and she'd say, well, of course I remember. You asked, I mean, she was asked, of course I remember this. And what's your favorite food here? Well, why are you asking me? I you know that I know, you know, and she would just like, she was there, she was back. That's amazing. So that was really very nice to get her back. 
You know, Absolutely. And, you know, and we're ready to put her in a home and that they didn't have to do that. So, by the way, she was, she was 85. That's so. amazing. It's really interesting. But how do you think the mechanism works? I mean, is it anti-inflammatory? Is it, what do you think is the key? Is it its effect on the neurotransmitters? Is it the combination? What is it about not just the CBD oil, but the effect obviously of the CBD on the endocannabinoid system? Uh, you know, how, what's the mechanism? Well, it's, it's interjecting itself into all these systems and making them work better. That's all I can say. We don't, there are a lot of fine points that we don't know about and there's increasing research. Like I said, we know that it uh, works on the 5-HT1A receptor, which is a serotonin receptor. So it enhances serotonin that way. It works to reduce inflammation. It re works on the immune system through the CB2 receptors, primarily in the gut. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of our immune system actually resides in the gut. It also works with the microbiome. So there are a lot of mysteries that we're gradually uncovering. So we don't, we don't know it all, but we do know, we, we do have a lot of research on the effects of CBD. And by the way, in research, in the studies, they use isolate because research is generally using a drug model. And in a drug model, you don't want to have things as they appear in nature. That's unfortunate. And it doesn't really make sense. Uh, you know, you can do an observational study, but if you, if you do like a double blind placebo controlled trial, you're gonna use isolate, which requires much higher doses. And that's not so good because, you know, why use a really high dose when a little bit of full spectrum will go a long way. Absolutely. And then if you take the CBD oil, can you take it for a long period of time? I mean, can you take it to support your, your system for a long part time? And also, if you do that, does it then reduce your own ability to create your own uh, cannabinoids, maybe blunt the receptors or, you know, create? Well, th that's a great question. And it's really the opposite. What happens is it retrains your own system. So what we find is that once you've gotten your level and you take it regularly for a while, you can actually cut back and observe. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, uh, people find they only need a booster once in a while. They don't need to keep taking it. You've retrained your endocannabinoid system. You've brought it up and things begin working again. So it's, uh, it, it's quite wonderful because it not only works in all these areas, but you don't have to deal with dependency, tolerance, or withdrawal that you do with so many other uh, really synthetic products, so you know, medications, basically. So you can take it for sort of a long period of time, but then you can taper off and not really notice the difference. But what's happened is that you've kickstarted your own endocannabinoid um, right. system. That's really interesting. And would you advise to take it, for instance, in times of intense stress to support yourself during these times of stress so that to keep everything working optimally? And then if you're less stressed, you can reduce. Is that how you would use it? That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then what if, you know, there are a lot of young people and maybe older people too, who self-medicate and they smoke weed because it makes them feel better and it calms their anxiety. But then the problem is it can also create more anxiety down the line. How would you recommend people using CBD if they're having quite a lot of anxiety or can't get off the couch because they're just, they've lost motivation for everything through smoking marijuana, or, I mean, I've heard this a couple of times, people who chronically use marijuana to self-medicate, you know, end up having a lot more anxiety or conversely, a lot more sort of lethargy and lack of motivation. How would you use CBD oil in those cases? Well, you're, you just hit the nail on the head. They need CBD to counterbalance okay. the, the pot, the THC actually. And uh, I'd recommend that they, if they want to take THC, they may be taking too high a dose. It may be too strong of a THC. So they need to cut back um, and they can find a dose that's 
that doesn't make them anxious, or maybe they're just very sensitive. Like I mentioned earlier, there are people who are more sensitive than others to the anxiety producing effect of THC, but giving the CBD will help to neutralize it regardless. As I said, what it does is it interferes with it sort of goes between the THC and the receptor because THC binds to the CB1 receptor. Um, CBD does not bind. So as I said earlier, remember it, um, it stops the breakdown. It interferes with the enzyme that breaks it down. So it keeps recirculating. So what, what I would do is take increasing amounts of CBD and that will help neutralize the THC and reduce the anxiety and bring the person back down to a state of calm. Or if they're kind of lethargic and unmotivated, it will actually start to bring up their, um, change, change the balance of dopamine, norepinephrine, um, GABA, it'll actually rebalance the neurotransmitters. Fantastic. And then let me ask you about uh, CBD and sleep, because I remember taking, I have insomnia. And so I took CBD to try and help me sleep. And it had a really weird effect on me. And I literally, I felt very calm in my body, but I, my mind was racing all night long and I slept even less than I usually did. And I was very surprised by this because on the one hand, I felt incredibly calm in my body, but my mind was racing. And then somebody said, well, maybe you should take the CBD in the morning rather than the evening. So I just wondered why that had had that effect. It's that there is a real biochemical individuality going on. And for some people, it is more activating. Uh, actually, for some people, if they take it during the day, it helps them to focus and concentrate. And if they take it at night, it helps them to relax and go to sleep. So again, it has that homeostatic effect. Uh, in your case, it sounds like it's activating in a way that's not pleasant if you want to sleep, but it's probably good if you take it during the, have you taken it during the day and found it? I found it helpful. Yeah. It increases focus, but in a calm way. So, right. So it would not be your first choice for sleep, or you can augment it with some GABA or theanine uh, or maybe tryptophan yeah. and see if that helps. And for instance, for ADHD, because I do know somebody who self-medicates his ADHD through smoking a lot of weed, and I'm wondering if CBD, in fact, would be a good way uh, of increasing focus and calm and, you know, uh, because I mean, ADHD, they say is sort of low norepinephrine and low dopamine. Would the CBD help in that situation? So instead of smoking to try and self-medicate and increase your dopamine and your norepinephrine, you take CBD to balance out those neurotransmitters? Yes, that, the answer is yes. Yeah. And we don't even know in each case, which it is in some cases of ADD and ADHD, there's actually a, a deficit in GABA or serotonin. So it's not, all, I think maybe we used to think more in terms of it was just the dopamine system, but it actually can involve all of the neurotransmitters and in different individuals, different ones. Fascinating. And inositol helps too. If you uh, take that, uh, I add that in for ADD, for OCD. Also, it, CBD is really good for uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, but adding an inositol up to 1600 milligrams, well, it, 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 which is called a secondary messenger can also help. That's a really interesting um, idea. So the inositol plus the CBD um, to help with the focus and the calm. That's fascinating. You are uh, obviously an integrative psychiatrist and CBD is sort of your, one of the things you gravitated towards because I think you found such wonderful results. But what are the other things? I mean, I know that there are so many other things in your toolbox in terms of helping people who have depression or anxiety or poor concentration or poor memory. What would be your sort of top five tips, obviously including the CBD to help people from an integrative perspective with their mental health symptoms? Sure. Well, to begin with, I think diet and lifestyle are extremely important. That's the base. You know, you can't just take anything 
including CBD, wonderful as it is, you really need to be eating the right kind of foods, eliminating the bad stuff, uh, finding out if there are any food sensitivities or intolerances and handling that. So it's exercise. So we have diet, exercise, um, social relationships are important, support system. We really need connection. And this past year that's been lacking and we've had a great increase, very sadly, huge increase in mental illness. Yeah, huge. And even suicides. Huge. So very, really tragic. So uh, some, th there are other modalities we can use. For example, neurofeedback. Neurofeedback, biofeedback, but particularly neurofeedback, which is biofeedback for the brain where your electrodes are placed on the scalp and you, re and you retrain your brain to um, rebalance itself and form new pathways. Um, there's tapping, there's or EFT, um, somatic experiencing. There are a lot of different modalities for dealing with mood issues and particularly post-traumatic stress disorder, which may underlie a lot of the um, mentalness that and it could be old, old PTSD from something you've even forgotten, but it sits in the background like a bad computer program. You don't know about it, but it's messing up your bio computer. So dealing with PTSD is very important. And it turns out the CBD is, works on the amygdala, which is the fear center. And what's interesting is what it does is helps to mitigate the fear factor you don't lose the memory. It doesn't obliterate the memory, you still have it, but it's not associated anymore with an emotional, an intense emotional reaction. It's very interesting. And in the context of all the sort of psychedelic research, so the research that's just come out on MDMA and PTSD, which has shown that it's incredibly helpful for PTSD. And obviously we're exploring uh, psilocybin and ketamines and all sorts of sort of compounds that, that had been banned. How would sort of CBD fit into that? And, and does do MDMA and these other compounds act on the endocannabinoid system? Do we know that? That's an excellent question. And I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, I, don't would think... imagine, I would imagine it does. Yeah. I, I can't would, be sure. Agreed. Because, I mean, there is a sort of resurgence of using these, these uh, natural but banned substances for mental health treatment in light of the fact that, you know, traditional psychiatric drugs are, are not really working. And so there's an effort and there's been much better results, in fact, with these other compounds. But if you, I guess CBD is much more readily available and you can take it without having the help of a therapist. And I, you know, I think, whereas first of all, the others are often banned substances, but also it's much more helpful to take them with a therapist to assist the sort of journey to healing. Whereas I think CBD can be seen more as a nutritional supplement almost to rebalance your system. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, very good distinction and very important. Just, just taking, you know, in the old days, people just taking, you know, LSD at a rock concert. That's not therapeutic. Therapeutic use of psychedelics is really the preparation, the therapeutic preparation, and then the journey. The guide, it could be, and, and the guides are there. They may not intervene very much, but they're there. Yeah. And then afterwards to integrate the experience, to talk about it, over um, a session or two or whatever the protocol is. And right now it's all in research protocols and it's still not legally available in all places. Although some places such as Denver and Oakland, Oakland, California, Denver, Colorado have legalized psilocybin. Wow, I didn't know that, that's fascinating. Well, I mean, I think that the, the, the danger is using it, you know, for recreational purposes versus using it for therapeutic purposes. And I think, you know, they're very different. And in some ways, I guess it's sort of the same distinction as CBD oil taken as a nutritional supplement versus smoking weed or to get high. So, you know, it's, it's, 
but these these all have their place but i certainly think cbd sounds amazing and and what do you think the future is for cbd how do you see it do you see it growing and what about the legalization of pot and how is that going to impact things well the farm bill of 2018 was very helpful because it made it legal um, in each state but federally cbd is still lumped together with um, all of cannabis, which includes marijuana. So until the FDA uh, decriminalizes or legalizes uh, THC, um, CBD is still under the shadow of it. Yeah. So hopefully that will happen soon. It is, uh, well, there's always legislation uh, pending. So I'm following it and you're following it and will everyone know when it happens. When it happens. And one final question, Hila, what about for children? I mean, if you have children, you know, there's a huge increase in anxiety and mental health issues amongst children, focus issues, anxiety, mood issues. What would you, I mean, it might, you know, this might be slightly uncomfortable, obviously you don't want to recommend things, but would you use CBD with children? Oh yeah, yeah, CBD is great for kids. You just titrate, you start low, and just as with an adult, you gradually build up as you deal with the target symptoms. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't think it's used in isolation. You know, being a, a functional medicine physician, I really have a whole armamentarium. Yeah. You know, doing diet, lifestyle, other supplements, and, uh, CBD just happens to have so many wonderful qualities and treat so many different conditions that it's it's my favorite, but it doesn't eliminate everything else. And that includes for children. And there is actually a, a whole school of uh, practice giving varying degrees of THC in the mixture for children. And there are specialists who know how to do this. And it's been extremely helpful in, in certain childhood conditions, um, such as autism, mm -hmm. where, where the moms will give varying amounts of THC and CBD, depending on the day and the behavior. So um, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, potential here. That's fascinating because I know, you know, there's a huge increase in um, panic disorder, anxiety, OCD, ADD, and it sounds to me as if this could be incredibly helpful. So, oh, by the way, if you're giving it to a child, it's good to clear it with their pediatrician. Yeah, smart. Absolutely. And I think more and more of them are becoming familiar with it. Agreed. And so, Haile, if we, so just to repeat, I'll put all this in the show notes, but we can uh, find out more at your website, which is www.casmd.com. And you have a lot of information on CBD there. Um, and we'll put all this in the show notes. And also in terms of, you know, your own manufacture and supply of CBD, uh, it's all on there as well, I presume. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. Hi. Well, thank you so much for your time. I found that super interesting and um, certainly makes me want to go off and get some CBD oil and try it immediately. So it sounds like a miracle wonder drug. So thank you. Or not drug, you're but so, <laughs> supplement. You're so welcome. And I want to thank you for the contribution you're making. Your organization is amazing. Your website, your outreach, education, uh, you're quite a resource. You've I've done this. You're, I, I am in awe of how of you and how you've done this. And I really deeply appreciate it just personally. That's so sweet, Hila. Thank you so much. Well, I have to say I was very inspired by people like you and Kat. And, you know, you, you guys have been the pioneers. And I think the word needs to get out there. And I think it is getting out there. But whatever I can do to spread the word of the work that you all are doing, um, and then it's great, you know, it's, it's thank you for doing what you do. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones or clients may take to start their healing journey. 
Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.